My interest in ocean worlds of the outer solar system is motivated by our search for life beyond Earth. Oh, there's a little clicker. Um, this is a, a question that has captivated me <laughs> since I was a young boy, a, a very dorky young boy, <laughs> growing up in a small town in Vermont. And uh, it's a question that National Geographic actually helped plant the seed in my, in my young brain with, uh, with this fantastic book that my best friend had, uh, where it had images, very speculative images, <laughs> of life in the atmosphere of Jupiter, some sort of mousy Martian, and I don't know, maybe this is a plesiosaur on Europa? Yeah, it, it. Since the decades when that book was published, a lot has changed about our understanding of what it takes for a world to be habitable. And what's been discovered is that there are actually at least six worlds. These are moons of the outer solar system, moons of Jupiter and Saturn, and Neptune, and possibly even Uranus, and possibly worlds even beyond Pluto. Worlds that are covered in ice, and beneath their icy shells, we have very good reason to believe that vast liquid water oceans exist. These are moons like Europa and Callisto and Ganymede, moons of Jupiter, Titan and Enceladus, moons of Saturn and Triton, a moon of Neptune. This presents a, an interesting new paradigm. Traditionally, when we thought about habitability, uh, the traditional habitable zone, as it's called in my field, consists of thinking about a solar system where you have a planet at just the right distance from its parent star, such that you have liquid water at the surface, stable at the surface, or at least metastable at the surface. And then if you move too far in or out, You'll either get too hot and have a runaway greenhouse effect, as the case is for Venus, or if you move too far in for Venus, too far out for Mars, uh, you, you'll, you'll freeze out and lose your atmosphere. And in either case, you'll either be too hot, too cold, or if you're in that habitable zone, you'll be just right. It's this sort of Goldilocks scenario. But we now know that this, this is an outdated scenario. This is the old Goldilocks. These icy moons of the outer solar system give us a new Goldilocks. It's a Goldilocks scenario that's regulated by tidal energy dissipation. Instead of being at the right distance from your parent star, it's about being at the right distance or having the right interaction with a giant planet. And this is best exemplified by the large moons of Jupiter. The innermost moon, Io, is the most volcanically active body in the solar system, more volcanically active than the Earth. The reason you see all these beautiful yellows and reds and whites is that Io is dehydrated. It lost all of its water and a lot of its volatiles. And instead, what covers its surface is sulfur, various forms of sulfur. So Io is too active to have an ocean. It lost all its water. On the outer end, the, the furthest out large moon of, of Jupiter is Callisto. Callisto is not very tidally active. It does have an ocean, but we don't think that that ocean is dynamic enough to, to potentially sustain life. In the middle, however, we've got Europa and Ganymede. And Europa might have just the right combination of tidal energy to sustain a liquid water environment and to help that water mix with a rocky seafloor and perhaps have that ice shell mix into the ocean to keep a dynamic ocean that's capable of supporting life. And this is fascinating because, of course, what we've learned from life on Earth is that where you find the liquid water, you generally find life. And on a world like Europa, we're talking about a global liquid water ocean of some 100 kilometers in depth beneath an ice shell of, say, 4 to 15 kilometers in thickness. If you do the math, it turns out that Europa's ocean harbors two to three times the volume of all the liquid water found here on Earth. That's an incredible amount of liquid water. It's there today, and it's been there throughout the history of the solar system. It's a beautiful place to go and explore this question of whether or not there is, in fact, life beyond Earth. And this question of, of uh, it, it, this, this also relates to another aspect of what fascinates me about our search for life beyond Earth. Because for all of the morphological, the, the physical diversity, that, that beautiful diversity that we all know and love here on Earth, uh, life on Earth is essentially all the same at the biochemical level. Even when you go to extreme environments like hot springs in the Rift Valley or the dry valleys of Antarctica or down to the deep sea hydrothermal vents. All life on Earth is based on the same paradigm, that DNA, RNA, and protein paradigm, even the ATP paradigm. Uh, 
And, and what fascinates me about the search for life elsewhere is the prospect that we might discover some other biochemical pathway, some other way that life gets the business of living done. And so worlds like Europa present a great place to go and, and test these kinds of questions. Perhaps life populates a sort of periodic table where different biochemistries function in different temperature, pressure, and chemical regimes. We just don't know. This is, uh, this is Enceladus, a beautiful picture of Enceladus floating above the rings of Saturn with Saturn as the backdrop. Just an absolutely stunning image. Enceladus is about 500 kilometers in diameter. And if you zoom in on Enceladus, this is what you see. The south pole of Enceladus is fractured and water is just jutting out from an ocean beneath its south pole. We still don't understand much about what's going on there. We frankly don't really understand the geophysics of how that ocean could persist there today because Enceladus is so small and that tidal energy uh, may or may not be able to account for all the energy that's needed to explain what we see. And so sometimes these oceans literally jump out at you, as is the case with, uh, with Enceladus, where you've got these water-rich jets uh, with salt and even organics uh, coming out above the surface. For many of the other ocean worlds, though, the evidence is, is not as obvious, but it's uh, very mature and, and equally robust. Shown here is Europa in relative scale to our own moon. It's about the size of our own moon. And Europa orbits, orbits Jupiter, some 318 times as massive as the Earth. And the reason we know of, ocean, of Europa's subsurface ocean has to do with a lot of physics that I don't have time to go into. But even if you just look at its surface, you see these amazing cracks and ice cliffs that are caused as that ice shell is, is uh, tugged and pulled as a result of the tidal interaction with Jupiter. And much of what my work focuses on is the electromagnetic interaction of Europa with Jupiter and what that tells us about the physics and chemistry of Europa. But part of what I also work on is the development of missions and instruments to go out and explore worlds like this to see whether or not there are any signs of life on the surface. And so when I look at an image like this, we know that this white area, this is all, so, so this is the highest resolution image that we have of the surface of Europa, and this is returned by the Galileo spacecraft. In the foreground, so this is sort of a perspective view across Europa's landscape. In the foreground, this is about six meters per pixel. We know that the white material here is water ice. The dark material, we know that there's some sulfur and sulfate mixed in there, but beyond that, we really don't know much about its chemistry. And part of what's uh, interesting in the instrument development context is that we want to be able to go back to Europa and characterize this non-ice material and see whether or not it has any complex organic chemistry, possibly even any structures or, or indications of life erupted from the ocean below and now uh, emplaced on the surface. Uh, and the tools and techniques to do that uh, are not entirely obvious. Uh, if you think about detecting life on Earth from space, you say, well, what tools do we apply for this problem? How, we've got all these satellites. Obviously, we, we monitor the terrestrial biosphere. So how do we actually do that? Well, the tools and techniques are pretty limited. Much of what we do from space is monitor photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, of course, has these amazing pigments like chlorophyll. And those pigments are sort of evolution's gift to spectroscopists. We can, we can pick out these sharp spectral features and then make maps of chlorophyll absorptions. And that serves as a proxy for much of the rest of the biomass found here on Earth. But for an ice-covered ocean world, photosynthesis is not going to be a very viable niche. So this spectroscopic tool uh, is, not, is not sufficient. We need to develop new tools and techniques to, uh, to enhance our capability both to monitor life here on Earth and to uh, improve our capability to search for life on other worlds. And this is where I have a lot of fun, both in the lab and, and uh, in the field. When you see an image like this, this is an image returned from the Mars Exploration Rover, uh, taken from a camera on board the, the platform. Here's the robotic arm, and at the end of the robotic arm are a bunch of science instruments doing geology on Mars. When you see an image like this and see these instruments, this is kind of, if this were a, a human evolution chart, this would sort of, this would be like Homo sapiens. What I work on is sort of the Australopithecus version of this. 
this is where it all starts. <laughs> and um, I made this cardboard mock-up several years ago of our instrument, which for the techies out there, our instrument is a mid-infrared Fourier transform spectrometer that can be used in microscope version or telescope version, et cetera. Uh, basically, I study fancy rainbows. Uh, spectroscopy looks at various wavelengths. But uh, what I love about this is that, um, you know, this is where ideas come to life. Just, we've got an idea for a new tool, a new technique, and, and this, is, this is it. This is the first sort of link on that evolutionary chain. The next step is to build it in the lab and then take it out into the field. Um, this is our early instrument, and this is, uh, this is the courtyard right in, out in front of my, my office building. And I felt compelled to put this in just so I had at least one picture of wildlife, uh, <laughs> given the crowd here. The, the deer actually do, uh, they're just out there in the courtyard, it's great. Um, and uh, then we take it out into extreme environments here on Earth, like Battleship Promontory in, in Antarctica. And as you may appreciate, the interior of Antarctica has no large creatures, but this landscape is teeming with life. My microbes that manage to, uh, to make a living in the, in the harsh night and cold temperatures of Antarctica. And we're able to bring our tools down there to study these cryptoendolithic microbial communities to monitor them in situ to get at their metabolism and their biogeochemistry. We've also used our tools and techniques up in Alaska where we're using our techniques to monitor hydrocarbons coming out of the permafrost. And this relates to our ability to detect hydrocarbons on other worlds, but also to quantify greenhouse gas emissions uh, as, our, as our planet warms. And we're starting to take this instrument to places like Kilimanjaro, where the glaciers contain an incredible record of our terrestrial climate history. And traditionally, what you have to do is go up and grab an ice core and bring it back to the lab. Well, with our new tools and techniques, we can do the science there. We can leave the site intact and, do, and get the science done in the field. But ultimately, what I want to do is bolt this instrument on, to, on the side of a spacecraft like this. Optimistically, we're hoping for a launch of either an orbiter or possibly a lander in the 2020 time frame. Uh, we'll go into orbit around 2028 because it takes such a long time to get there. This search for life beyond Earth, um, it's ultimately a pretty optimistic uh, endeavor, and it's one that, that really sees altruism and, and symbioses as fundamental to evolution. And Frank Drake captured this, this sentiment in his now sort of famous Drake equation, uh, where he put together all the, the factors needed to estimate how many intelligent communicating civilizations might be out there in our galaxy. And this last factor, this L factor, is the lifetime of an intelligent communicating civilization. And if the lifetime is short, then intelligent life in our galaxy will be rare and it will be hard for us to ever find each other. And what I love about being here today is that this, this factor, is where so many of you contribute. So, many, so much of what National Geographic does is focus on how to make L a very big number, to make this a safe, clean, and beautiful planet and home for all creatures and cultures. I want to close by, by bringing us back out into the realm of space and share one of my favorite images from the history of space exploration. It's an image carved by the hand of Galileo in his notebook some 400 years ago. This image showed for the first time that Jupiter had moons and that the moons go around Jupiter, proving that the bright object in the sky known as Jupiter was not some mysterious orb, but instead it was a world in its own right. Images like this helped revolutionize our understanding of the universe in which we live. Galileo painstakingly charted Jupiter and the motions of its four large moons, and in so doing, put the final nails in the coffin of Aristotelian cosmology. The Earth was no longer the center of the universe. Instead, the planets go around the sun, this heliocentric worldview. And in the decades that followed, Galileo, in the decades that followed Galileo, scientists like Kepler and Newton would show that the laws of physics work not just here on Earth, but they could also be extended to world and wonders beyond Earth. And we know now that the laws of physics permeate the universe, and over the course of the last three centuries, other sciences, like chemistry and geology, have also been extended to worlds and wonders beyond Earth. But when it comes to the science of biology, when it comes to this beautiful phenomenon that we all know and love called life, 
We have yet to extend that beyond uh, our own world. And what fascinates me about the time in which we live is that in the next few decades, we will have the missions, we will do the exploration that revolutionizes our understanding of whether or not life here on Earth is a biological singularity or if we, in fact, live in a biological universe. Thank you.